I don't know how monos are treated in the Supreme Court, um, but I've been a mono in the High Court, um, uh, where you are uh, the jack of all trades, uh, issues of welfare, issues of nearly everything. Um, when I joined the High Court, there were no researchers, so they relied on the on the junior judge to um, do all this on behalf of the rest. So. Um, I know I've experienced that. Um, the, the Supreme Court um, can be accessed through various ways by litigants. Uh, and the determining, most times, the determina determining factor is the matter in issue. Could my Lord please tell us and well, you've been in this place, in this space for the longest time, so what we didn't cover last time and I haven't covered now will be left uncovered because that will be my last question to you. Uh, the m many ways of accessing the court and which of them you think sh should be tricked a bit? Which one should be? Be lady? tricked. Which one should, shouldn't remain that way? If there's one. Um, my lady, if I understand the question, um, you're asking about the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court has um, original jurisdiction uh, first. Um, to determine disputes regarding presidential elections. Uh, it has um, a jurisdiction to hear appeals from the Court of Appeal, other courts and the tribunals. It has jurisdiction to give advisory opinion. Other courts and tribunals, my lord? That's, uh, what my reading of Article 163 says. Which tribunals, my lord? And the tribunal. Sorry, which tribunals? My oh, lord? Um, uh, they call local, but I, I believe there's only one tribunal which I was going to come to um, that uh, it has a jurisdiction over. Um, uh, advisory opinion, and then, of course, um, to deal with issues of. Um, of declaration of state of emergency and uh, finally um, um, decisions of a tribunal um, investigating the conduct of uh, a judge. Um, which one it shouldn't? Um, I think all of them Kenyans thought were useful areas to take to the court being an apex court and um, other than the one on declaration of state of emergency, the court has uh, been able to express itself in all of them. The one on tribunal, I think there has only been one of Judge, uh, Judge uh, Mutava. Thank you, my lady. Uh, the, um, yes, my lord. There's another one pending, and I'm sure there will be many more. Uh, my lord, that will be it from me. I wish you well, my brother. Thank you. Thank you, my lady. Thank you very much, uh, Acting CJ. I will now request the uh, Honorable Judge Wasame to ask some questions. Thank you, Chair Professor. Uh, my lord, uh, welcome once again. Thank you. My lord, there has been a lot of mamas around the court that it has not lived to its feeling, that uh, the court is taking up unnecessary cases, and the jurisprudence that is coming out from that court, it's not, uh, it's somewhat uh, contradictory, and sometimes unnecessary. Uh, you have been in the Court of Appeal now almost f five or six years, you have been the president of the Court of Appeal. You have done extremely well for the court. For the last three years, you have been the head. 
now that you will be the mono. Uh, one thing you will do to change that perception about the court. Thank you, my lord. Um, yes, the perceptions are really just perceptions because um, if you read the decisions from the Supreme Court and this opportunity um, appearing before this uh, commission twice has given me an opportunity to read a lot of decisions from that court. I cannot um, agree with those criticisms. The, those cases are very well researched, well reasoned. Um, there may be one or two uh, which cannot uh, be a basis to make a general blanket um, assumption that everything is wrong. Um, if you honor me with this position, and I go to that court to, re to reduce this perception. And I think the court also speaks to this in its uh, strategic plan, is to reach out, to talk to Wananchi, to explain uh, to the consumers of their services of what they do, how they arrive at those decisions. Um, I also agree, and um, it is in their strategic plan, to involve uh, reviews from the academia, reviews from the lawyers, and this way um, those perceptions will be reduced, if not uh, completely eliminated. <clears throat> uh, now that uh, you have talked about what you do, one stakeholder who appeared before us who is an advocate told us, and I quote, it is difficult to advise clients on any matter pending before the Supreme Court. What is your view? That um, presupposes that the decisions of the Supreme Court are contradictory, um, and therefore the advocate is not able uh, to tell um, how the client's case may proceed. Um, again, I can say, unless we have details, particulars, that I was unable to advise my client, who was an MCA, who wanted to appeal to the Supreme Court because there are contradictory decisions on that aspect of elections in that court, then it can be addressed. But just saying generally that I'm not able because there are contradictory decisions, it doesn't really help. Um, you will recall um, in our court whenever we have this, and, and they are there where we, we have contradicted ourselves. So we, we admit that here we have because advocates have either drawn our attention to them by asking the president to constitute a five-judge bench to resolve the conflicting decisions. Um, I really uh, would not say much regarding that without details of those contradictions, my lord. Uh, we were also informed, my lord, that, and this was uh, supported with that, uh, that position taken by the stakeholder, and he said, a matter before the Electoral Commission is the validity or eligibility of a candidate to contest or be nominated. That is before the IEBC, before the High Court, before the Court of Appeal, but when it reaches the Supreme Court, that eligibility question is changed to something else. Any views? Thank you, my lord. Um, again, I'm guessing you are uh, referring to the Wajir governatorial. No, I'm not referring to any matter. Okay. But that's what yeah. uh, we were told. Um, yes, but I can deduce. Um, 
that's one area that perhaps uh, is difficult to reconcile. And as I said last time, that there are criticisms. Some have uh, valid basis, some don't have. Some are just generalized, some may be particularized. And that the court needs 10 years later to introspect, to reevaluate its performance um, uh, going forward. And some of these um, areas, like the one you've just said, um, uh, is important because then um, uh, the court being um, one whose decisions bind on the courts uh, below it must be seen to have um, a very clear um, instructions to the courts below by way of uh, president. Okay, again, and uh, this is my last question, my lord, one area which you have done very well as the president of the Court of Appeal is to ensure that electoral disputes are decided within the timelines, within the six month period. Uh, from my own research, if you get the opportunity, God willing, I have seen some matters taking almost one year, some others taking nine months before uh, the Supreme Court and before they are decided. Uh, I don't know how you will change and ensure that if a magistrate has decided a matter within six months, a judge of the High Court has decided within maybe four months or three months, Court of Appeal has decided the matter within two or three months, and the Supreme Court is taking uh, a period more than six months, although there is no time restriction of the Supreme Court, and this is the Apex Court. What kind of example would you ensure that the court follows such that timelines are clearly respected, such that there is nobody complaining about the court in terms of delaying hearing of uh, electoral disputes? Um, from the magistrates' courts all the way to the Supreme Court with regard to presidential elections, uh, there are timelines. And I must say that um, the courts have done exceptionally well uh, in keeping to those timelines uh, all the way. Um, and this is perhaps attributable to the training that uh, is conducted throughout the period preceding elections and even after the debriefs that follow uh, where we discuss um, jurisprudential issues, where we discuss these timelines. Um, and so when, whereas all courts were able to render their decisions within those timelines, um, as you have correctly pointed out, the Supreme Court doesn't have timelines um, in election petitions other than those uh, of presidential election. Um, they may go beyond six months. I do not know of any case. Um, there's only one case that uh, perhaps two that have uh, bothered me. Uh, I think the Waibera case, the thicker one, uh, which has gone back and forth. It's going to uh, four years after elections and it is still pending somewhere. Uh, it's gone back and forth. I haven't read the history why it is still pending and the one of Honorable uh, Karua. Um, I do not think that uh, for those two cases you can blame the Supreme Court for going beyond the period because for Honorable Karua, the back and forth between the Court of Appeal and the High Court consumed all the six months. Um, um, and so I think through this training uh, where we as a court sit together um, in the Court of Appeal identifying um, all the election 
uh, appeals, applications, and they are all given priority. The same can be used in the Supreme Court as they come. You put aside everything else and concentrate on them. That way we shall be able to uh, meet the deadline. <clears throat> Although there is no timeline for the Supreme Court, wherever they are seized of um, matters to do with elections, I think it should also follow suit that it ought to be six months for them. Okay. Now that you have mentioned uh, Mother Karua, let me have the last uh, bite. Uh, I think both of us were involved in the Mother Karua, the first Mother Karua case. And uh, you can remember the judge in the High Court rendered that ruling striking out the petition, I think, within two months. Mother Karua filed her appeal in the Court of Appeal, I think in uh, October or November, before the matter could be listed. It took almost three months. It took almost three months in the registry. So it cannot be said Mother Karua now consumed the six months, because the six months in the High Court and the six months in the Court of Appeal. Because if the court delayed her case before listing it for two months, and there were several letters we read in the file, and uh, the matter now was decided that uh, we are folding our hands because the six month is, period is over. This is a case where the litigant who is aggrieved by the outcome of uh, Kirinyaga uh, elections was concerned and that she did not use uh, cumulatively six months, both in the High Court and in the Court of Appeal. What would be a view now that uh, there is an indictment from uh, the East African Court? Um, I didn't blame Honorable Karua. I, for the time consumed, actually admitted it was the courts. If in our court alone we took three months of somebody six months, um, that's an indictment on us. Um, and so my view is um, really the same thing, that we must give priority to matters that have timelines. Uh, very true, me and you had the first appeal um, where we overturned the striking out even as we sent the matter back to the High Court, remember the debate between us took nearly two days, whether there was enough time for the High Court to hear witnesses and render a decision within perhaps maybe six days left. But we said there was still time. Let them go and see if they can do it within those days. It was a tall order. And so really um we must take the blame for the delay in hearing this uh, petition and the appeal thank you thank you very much my lord i wish you well thank you my lord thank you uh judge wasame thank you your honor uh, judge majada is your turn to engage the judge thank you yes sir uh, thank you chair uh once again good morning my lord morning. Uh, i just want to follow up on um two issues um from the discussions you had with my colleagues. The issue of MCA appeals, you, you mentioned something, but you, you didn't quite complete uh, what the idea you were saying. Um, what is the, the legal position regarding MCA appeals to the Supreme Court? Um, it has now, uh, the, the I was saying that, <coughs> excuse me, with regard to the question that I was asked that counsel is not able to advise client uh, uh, regarding decisions of the Supreme Court. And I just said as an example uh, that unless that client is asking specific questions that I want to appeal to the Supreme Court as an M MCA and the decisions are conflicting, the Supreme Court has now settled this matter. Um, in the case of Tumaini, mm -hmm. um, where the Supreme Court has said that these things must end at the High Court, and that is the position. Okay. 
Now, uh, can you now look at that decision vis-a-vis -vis the position of the court of uh, the Supreme Court in the other election petitions where they are saying that uh, because the Elections Act is a normative derivative of the Constitution, a party in an election petition can go all the way up to the Supreme Court. Don't you think there is a contradiction and how would you reconcile it in view of the latest decision? Um, the MCA disputes start from the magistrate's court, the appeal to the high court. If they were to have a second appeal, it would be to the court of appeal and then to the, so those are too many levels uh, which other uh, electoral um, uh, contests uh, do not have. Um, normative derivative um, was a creation in Munya 1 um, where the court uh, more or less suggested that anything to do with elections emanating um, or under the Elections Act have a trajectory, those are the words they have used in Munya, a trajectory um, uh, towards the uh, Constitution and therefore they can reach the Supreme Court. But my Lord will remember that um, by and by the Supreme Court very reluctantly have plowed back. If you read um, the this one decision where they have, yes, um, Zebedeo Opore, Opore, yeah, where they have clearly now stated that you must satisfy the court that the matter before it, or the matter you intend to take before it, has element of constitutional interpretation and application and secondly that it's a matter that the courts below will have address their minds to. Okay. So um, are you saying, in view of that decision, that in fact there are instances where an MCA petition uh, would reach the Supreme Court if the parties framed and litigated an issue of and concerning interpretation and application of the Constitution? That is likely. If if it started from the magistrate's court, that the issue we are pursuing is on the Constitution, the High Court decides on the constitutional issue before it, the same as the Court of Appeal, then it qualifies. Okay. Uh, the, the, the second case was the Wajir uh, Governor's, and then I'll mention it, the Wajir Governor's election petition. Um, if I recall, and uh, probably you will tell me if the facts are wrong, the main issue, uh, actually there were two issues in the High Court, whether the governor was qualified and whether the election was free and fair, the counting and all that. After an extensive hearing, the High Court said the governor was not qualified. The Court of Appeal reviewed, as it is entitled to, reviewed the fact and said the governor was not qualified. And then the Supreme Court took a different position. The question I want to ask, what is the standard of review of factual findings of two concurrent courts, two concurrent, the, 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 the High Court and Court of Appeal have made concurrent findings of fact that, in fact, this person is not qualified. What is the level and standard of review expected of the Supreme Court in those kind of instances? Yes, um, that's one case that I think the Supreme Court um, perhaps needs to look at because of the kind of uh, uh, criticism that has come uh, as a result. Um, and I think uh, the dissenting opinion of the retired CJ 
um, to some of us um, makes more sense because he draws an anal analogy uh, between the requirement to be elected as president of the nation where the requirements are set out in the Constitution and that if any of those requirements are not met, then the candidate is not qualified to contest. And so um, if one of the requirements is this certificate that you ought to have and two courts below have analyzed and um, assess that evidence and is, are satisfied that um, that certificate is not there or has not been presented. Um, going by the decision in uh, Munya, the, uh, unless the Supreme Court is satisfied that uh, the factual um, review by these uh, two courts uh, did not meet the threshold that they had set in Munya, is only then that it would reverse the factual finding. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the next question, and this will probably be my second last, is um, Article 43 uh, of the Constitution protects economic and social rights. Uh, can you just tell us why these rights are important, uh, number one, uh, why they are important, and two, what challenges are there in terms of justiciability and enforcement of social and economic rights? Oh, what a mouthful. Um, <laughs> okay, um, why are they important? And, yes, uh, why uh, are they important, first and foremost? I think um, the people of Kenya um, decided for the first time to give very elaborate rights, economic and social rights, um, because of the realization of the, the differences in the society, um, in, so as to um, provide for those who do not have and, uh, and um, promote um, the growth of the economy. Um, why the justiciability? Um, there haven't been very many um, such cases, perhaps because of um, perhaps the same reason, poverty. Um, uh, and, and therefore there have been very, very few. Um, again, going by the decisions and even the, the provisions in the Constitution um, where all these rights depend on the government's ability to meet them, uh, those perhaps are some of the challenges and reasons why uh, they are uh, few and in between. Okay. And finally, uh, this is a quote from uh, Mr. Wanyoike uh, on devolution. And he says that in many ways the Supreme Court has developed progressive jurisprudence on uh, devolution, which seeks to protect county governments and help assert their constitutional space. Probably you would uh, just give us one decision you think has uh, satisfied this criteria of being progressive and supported the um, devolution? Maybe one or two decisions you think have been important and why? The Council of Governors' decision um, on uh, division of revenue uh, is one of them um, because in that decision um, it was settled how disputes between the two levels of parliament are to be resolved so as not to delay disbursement of funds to the uh, counties. Um, uh, that's one. Um, again, the, 
I think the one for EMBU, um, a decision emanating from EMBU regarding the position of deputy governors um, where um, there is no deputy governor, what happens, I think all that go to um, strengthen the evolution. Okay. Uh, and finally, um, are you aware of the Maputo Protocol? Yes. Um, on the environment? On the rights of women? Uh, no. Uh, unless you um, jog my memory. The Maputo Protocol is a protocol to the African Charter yes, for yes, people and human yes, rights. Yes, I'm aware. So what, what is, uh, what are the key, what is the purpose of that protocol? Just what is the purpose of the protocol, Maputo Protocol? After the charter, um, I think there were two protocols. Um, no, one, the one that created the court, and then the, the one that um, brought in the right of women, um, uh, uh, where uh, it, it was emphasized that uh, the right of women must be recognized, um, the practices that are uh, harmful to women, uh, things like uh, FGM was discussed, the right to property, um, uh, and also um, uh, I can remember only those. Uh, okay, two. thank you very much and uh, wish you well. Thank you, my lord. Thank you very much, Honorable Judge Majaja. Thank you, Your Honor, for those answers. Uh, Commissioner Basharia, uh, please go ahead. Okay. My, my lord, I'll ask you very few questions. Uh, the, the first one is, um, uh, you know, I'm impressed by your humility. Because you know you are one of the, of course, one of the leading candidates for this position of uh, CJ, and you've taken it in stride and with a lot of humility, which has kind of you know uh, won me over. Now, and um, I would be interested in knowing because this was an opportunity for others to learn. You know, you know, uh, there are also students of law who are out there watching the other Kenyans. What makes you like that? You know, to to be a humble person who is able to take, you know, uh, results of a situation in stride and move on because it's, it's something that lacks in, in, in many of us. Ah, thank you, Commissioner. Um, some of these things are very difficult to explain. Uh, they are just uh, things that people are born with. Um, perhaps the upbringing, uh, uh, perhaps our training. So my humility, um, I can say that uh, we are all humble in our family, uh, so perhaps it's hereditary. Um, also the upbringing uh, to respect others and not to talk at the top of your voice um, uh, really just um, upbringing uh, in the family. Uh, so I really have uh, no particular um, fact I can attribute to uh, my humility if I am. <laughs> Thank and, you. and how do you uh, use that quality? Because it's an important quality, you know, all of us, you know, lawyers, we have, like, you know, position, you understand the law. You know, jurisprudence, it, one cannot say they'll challenge you on it because you've probably seen it all. But you'll find that when it comes to these other personal attributes, even the very brilliant, when they lack it, they are not useful to the society. So I'm, I'm, how do you use those attributes in the court that you're going to in the Supreme Court? Um, the same way I've used them um, as a magistrate, as an administrator in the judiciary, and in the Court of Appeal, where you strive always to bring people together, um, to resolve conflicts, um, uh, to be able to 
see other person's point of view, to be patient, to listen, and to be slow, uh, to talk back. Um, those are some of the attributes that I've used uh, in my career, and uh, uh, if I'm honored um, to go to the Apex Court, the same attributes will not change. Okay. Now, the, the other question is that, um, you know, looking at your uh, career, um, you know, you started from the bottom, district magistrates, two, prof, professional, as you used to call them. Now, uh, you've grown through the ranks, you know. Of course, on merit, you've, you've earned all the way. You know, you know, there are many lawyers who would opt to go to private practice because it was easier to make money faster. There are those who sacrificed and decided to be uh, in the judiciary, others, government, you know, uh, and others. Now you'll be going to the Apex Court, and you know, you, it's the dream of every legal practitioner uh, to end up, because that's the highest court, whether it's in the US, whether it's UK, whether it's Kenya, that's the ultimate. Now, uh, tell me, what is this impact? Because I don't want it just to be that uh, umefika, you know, <laughs> that enough, like now you self-actualization, you've reached the apex. What is this impact, one single impact that you believe you'd want to make in that court now that you'll be you will have reached more or less where every other person dreams to be in the legal profession. Yeah, thank you, um, Council. Some of us joined the bench um, because we wanted to serve. There wasn't pay to talk about at the time we joined. And uh, as you join the bench and ask any magistrate today, what they aspire to be. When you join the bench and that's where you want to spend your time, you have not joined it uh, for any other reason, the, your eye is on the topmost court and on the topmost job, the Chief Justice and the Supreme Court. And so it is the journey I have uh, traveled, <coughs> excuse me, um, I've uh, tried to do it um, on a very straight line, no cutting corners, um, and so should I be lucky to reach uh, the top court, the way I have conducted my matters, the way I've related to colleagues, is the same way that I will um, conduct my matters and relate to my colleagues. Um, specifically, um, my concern has always been um, access and uh, expeditious delivery of uh, judicial service. Um, I know the Supreme Court doesn't have a backlog to talk about, but the focus, because we'll be working, God willing, as a team, is to ensure that the court becomes real time. To ensure that the pending matters, I know there are reasons why they have backlog in that court, uh, the numbers and um, uh, conflicts. Um, some judges having had those appeals from the high court is to reduce those, that backlog by deliberate uh, case management so that the court becomes real time, so that um, a matter filed this year is heard this year. The judges have enough time to do thorough work on the judgments and rulings that they uh, produce. So the focus really is backlog reduction and uh, expeditious disposal. Okay, my, my final question. Uh, next year we'll have uh, the presidential elections. Um, and you know how that is a big issue in this country. A lot of divisions and actually our country is like we, we all become mad, you know. Now, and that court is very critical in uh, keeping the country together. Now, for you, what assurance do you give to Kenyans that uh, you'll also play your role and how would you play to ensure 
that ultimately as a country, Kenya, Kenya is the winner at all times, regardless of how the situations unfold. How do you ensure that you are playing your right for all in ensuring that ultimately Kenya, Kenya is the, is the winner? Um, we have seen divisions um, previously um, and Kenyans are very quick in labeling judges whenever they make decisions, not just in the Supreme Court but even in the other courts, labeling them um, to be supporters of certain political groupings um, labeling them ethnically um, and so um, as a judge the oath that I take to defend the constitution to do justice without favor, affection or ill will is going to be the flag that I will carry that it will not matter who or what the bottom line is justice must be served to the best of my ability. Thank you, my lord, and I wish you well. Thank you. Oh, are you done, Commissioner? Oh, okay. Um, Honorable Attorney General, this is your time to please engage the judge. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. My Lord, good morning again. Good morning, good morning. Please allow me to take you back to the discussion we had where, in answer to a question by the Honorable Mr. Justice Wasame, when we spoke about perceptions uh, in the Supreme Court. One of those perceptions of which you're well aware, and it's constantly in the social media, uh, allegations of corruption and bribery keeps coming up time and again. Now in the event that you find yourself being appointed to join that court, you'll be joining that court with that backdrop. As judge number seven in a collegial court which you're familiar with, how would you engage your colleagues from the president of the court, the deputy and the other judges, to address that particular um, problem in the court? Thank you, uh, Mr. Tony. Perceptions, because um, the work we do as judges, as courts, cannot be equated to a football match uh, between two teams, where sometimes people win, sometimes it's a draw. There is no draw in a dispute resolution. There's a winner and a loser. And winners will celebrate. Losers will not join them. Losers will look for excuses why they lost. And so um, there are those um, mamas that, um, you know, decisions are made on account of um, other considerations other than merit. Um, there has never been any specific case because then we would be having people before uh, ESCC and court. But that is not to say that um, these rumors are just rumors. Um, if there are rumors, then we must find out what is causing this. And I know in the strategic plan of the Supreme Court, they have identified interventions to address these perceptions. Um, uh, you know, training, they've talked about um, um, 
engaging each other just as uh, you have suggested, just talking and finding out where are these gaps that make people think that we are on the take. Um, and so if I'm lucky to join the court, um, it is a conversation that I think can be taken forward as the court reviews its performance for the last 10 years. A conversation among ourselves helps, like in our court, we talk about these things very, very openly, um, and we keep reminding each other that we are lucky, first and foremost, to serve in the second top court in the Court of Appeal. And secondly, that the government has invested in us, in terms, and the people of Kenya, in terms of our salary, in terms of our, our allowances and other benefits that we should not be susceptible to any um, corrupt um, um, temptations. Thank you very much, my Lord. Um, moving on to another aspect um, on judicial independence. The threat to judicial independence, as you know, my Lord, is uh, usually understood and associated with external pressure from either the executive or the legislature. But having served in a collegiate court, you are also aware that there can be pressure from within the court itself and the colleagues you've been working with. How have you balanced, on the one hand, the aspect of collegiality and on the other hand, your independence as a judge in making decisions? Thank you. Independence of the judiciary, all the time when we talk about it, the focus is on the other two branches of government. Um, we also ought to be independent of each other. Um, there may be instances where um, a colleague uh, tries to influence you, or even where a member of the family or any other person out there, a friend. In a collegiate court, um, you you have to be very open with each other. You have always to disclose um, your interest. Um, the interest that you need to disclose ought to be something like, um, I dealt with this matter at some point only on a preliminary uh, stage. It cannot be a disclosure that I have been approached by so and so. Uh, because in that case, then um, uh, that will be the end. Um, and so um, there ought to be openness as a, as a college of judges uh, to discuss things openly. And how, my Lord, would you deal with that uh, aspect, bearing in mind that you're only seven judges and you may be compelled on occasion to invoke the doctrine of necessity. So you're conflicted on the one hand, but the doctrine of necessity dictates otherwise. How would you deal with that sort of situation? Um, the doctrine of necessity, um, if, if we, were go to, we were to go back to history, its origin um, uh, in common law that um, you are permitted to commit a crime in order to save a worse risk or calamity. Uh, it was developed uh, to save situations. Um, and the examples that are given uh, are many. For instance, if 
uh, it is illegal to drive without a driving license, but you have a patient who is or in an accident situation, somebody who is going to die involved in an accident. So although you have no driving license, to save this life, you will break the law by driving this patient to the hospital. That's necessity. And the same principle therefore applies so that although um, we have this conflict, but we are only seven, the fact that we know, the fact that you have disclosed it, we will now keep an eye on you as we go along. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, Honorable Judge President, again in the event that you are appointed to this court, you find yourself being invited to a workshop, uh, an induction and bonding session with your colleagues, the other six judges of the court. And you're invited to make a contribution to the agenda for that bonding workshop. What, what items would you want to see, would you yourself suggest for that very first meeting where you're going to have an opportunity to discuss matters of the court with your colleagues. What, what one or two items would you have on that agenda? And what would inform that, my Lord? And that would be all for me. Thank you, Mr. Tony. Um, the first session is uh, bonding and orientation. Um, from what we have been discussing regarding that court since the, uh, this morning when the interview started, um, I'll have an uh, agenda to do with the jurisprudence. Um, how do we make sure that uh, our jurisprudence is respected? Um, how do we um, make sure that this court remains together as a collegiate court. Um, um, I'll also put in that agenda um, the issue of, um, of uh, dissenting opinions. Um, and finally, the timelines for delivery of judgments and rulings uh, because I I get the sense um, sometimes that uh, from what I read in the media that although the, the timelines for delivery of judgments and rulings um, is 90 days according to the Supreme Court Act and I think the rules as well, that there are um, judgments on notice. Um, uh, uh, is a practice that perhaps, uh, if it is existing, uh, is a practice that needs to be looked at again. I am most obliged, my lord. That will be all for me, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Attorney General. Now is the time for Commissioner Kishohi to continue the questioning. Thank you, Chair. Judge, good morning again. Good morning. I want us to focus on two issues. I will be very brief as a state officer in the Supreme Court. And I want us to reflect on Article 10 of the Constitution on national values and principles of governance. And one of the principles that define use under that article is the promotion of national unity and patriotism. In your view, how will you promote that value as a state officer, as a judge in the Supreme Court? national unity and patriotism, those two. Um, national unity, patriotism, and you are a judge, it can only be through your judgments and your decisions. Mm -hmm. They should reflect that uh, you are truly a patriot, and they should also reflect that you are alive to the need of having the country united.
Mm -hmm. In the event of matters of public interest, national importance, does it uh, matter? Of course it will, it will matter because if we close our eyes um, in some of these matters, and remember last uh, time I was before the Commission, I gave examples of decisions that we have made um, as a judiciary that have far-reaching uh, consequences on, on the economy, on the development of this country. And so, yes, that will also matter. Very good. Chair, sure, I've got something else. In this case, I'm focusing myself on the strategic plan for the Supreme Court 20, up to 2024. And one of the two of the objectives there it is to the staff, enhancing staff skills and competence as one of the strategies that they need to, to realize between 20, year 2020 and 2024. As a judge in that court, how will you be able to assist the court realize that objective, enhancing staff skills and competence? Two things you do. Um, the, the court has uh, the president, has uh, vice president, has a registrar, deputy registrar, and the other administrative uh, staff. Mm -hmm. uh, that is one court working together. Uh, judges, including the, the president and the vice president, are equal. Mm -hmm. um, and being one family, we obviously have um, a forum where we can provide some of the uh, solutions and I believe the strategic plan uh, focuses on uh, the training, training of, yes. of staff mm -hmm. and also on provision of tools of trade. What do they need in order to deliver? Okay. They also have in the same strategic plan a provision to provide a safe, conducive working environment. That's one of the challenges and they want to address that within the 2020-2024 plan. How would you do that? Safe, conducive working environment. Yes. Um, I, I haven't been Um, and so they have um, a strategic um, uh, roadmap on how to address this. Um, in that plan, they have proposed that the court uh, gets its own premises for building uh, where all the facilities, suitable facilities, will be available. Mm -hmm. So how will you assist them get that? If they haven't gotten already, um, the, it is really just to look for land. Uh, we did in the Court of Appeal through, of course, the Office of the Chief Justice and the Chief Registrar. Mm -hmm. And we got land. Um, again, to the Treasury, we got money, which mm -hmm. we were meant to have started building. Um, or design work is complete. So again, really, it's just to get land. And um, even where we are start sitting today uh, can be land that mm -hmm. can be used to build a proper Supreme Court. Okay. Finally, Madam Chair, Honorable Judge, under the medium term program 2018-2020, and this is about judiciary whole, there's a flagship program under Fusion 2030. Uh, are you aware about that program? Vision 2030, yeah. yes, I am. So why is that uh, in terms of the judiciary under the medium term 2018-2020? Where are we? Uh, answers a very prominent question. 
Um, I know there are uh, three uh, key areas in the in the medium term: the social, political, and economic. Mm -hmm. um, and the judiciary falls in uh, political. I have not known how. Um, and uh, we have undertaken to ensure that. Uh, the rule of law is uh, realized. Um, I can say that uh, uh, if I was to give um, out of uh, ten, I would give three, three out of ten, because um, a rule of law means that everybody is obeying the law. The law applies equally to everybody. So why I'm giving it three is that we still have. Uh, people who do not obey the law. Okay. They do not even obey court orders, hence three over ten. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Judge. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We show him now our request, uh, Commissioner Koskei, to ask his question. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Judge. Good morning, Commissioner. Yeah, I have uh, three questions. I wanted to pursue still uh, on the issue of the value that you are going to bring into Supreme Court. You said you don't want to criticize the office that you are joining for obvious reasons. And um, you also responded to Masharia that I think we will work on the issues of speeding up the work of Supreme Court, which, which is commendable. I wanted us to focus now on your wealth of experience in administration. You've been in judiciary for 34 years. You, 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 there's no office that you've not uh, run in this institution, except some few, perhaps. And, and therefore, I really wanted to know what what other value that will boost uh, the liberty service in, in the Supreme Court. From my time as a magistrate, working in this same building, um, working in various courts in the country, in the High Court, and currently in the Court of Appeal, we have been privileged to um, lead my colleagues. Um, I believe in one thing, in consultation before decisions are made. Um, I have worked um, in these courts with people who are senior to me um, when I worked in uh, the only place I worked in the High Court where I was alone was uh, Malindi. Um, thereafter, I worked in Meru under a judge. I worked in Nakuru under a judge. And I worked in the Court of Appeal under the President. And it is normally my approach to uh, contribute uh, whatever knowledge I have on how to improve the administrative aspect of the courts. So for instance, I worked um, in Nakuru under the former Chief Justice and uh, two others. So I was actually again the mono, as uh, was said earlier. Um, but of course, because of uh, my background, I was able to um, agree as a team with my colleagues that uh, certain things ought to be done in a particular way in order for us to uh, maximize on our service delivery. So it's the same thing, God willing, if I'm honored uh, to go to the <coughs> Supreme Court. The same approach that you look at the gaps and if there are gaps that um, you can be able to fill, then you make a proposal and it is owned by the rest of the team. Thank you. Um, my second question is on on how we can position judiciary in helping the country in economic development, economic growth. And as you are aware, the executive are, are trying their best. They are trying to loosen their procedures and regulations, enhancing security to ensure that this country becomes attractive. 
and the parliament also are trying to you know to enact laws and and, and statutes that will also speed up um, investors coming in and you know to help us in, in, in sorting out most of these social problems that we have. Now coming to judiciary, having a wealth of experience in judiciary all along from district magistrate to court of appeal and now uh, God willing you'll be in Supreme Court. What in what ways will or in what ways can you know judiciary and even Supreme Court help uh, this country in, in, in trying to, to make it uh, attractive to investors, in making it uh, be very attractive to businessmen so that all these unemployment problems, the challenges that we have, will, will a bit subside or, or be brought down so that uh, the country can, can have rapid economic growth. The, a survey that was uh, conducted by World Bank um, uh, some two years back, I think, uh, on ease of doing business has shown that Kenya has risen uh, from where it was in Africa and in the world. In Africa, I think we've gone down from, I think, position six to, no, four to six. Um, uh, but um, across the 190 countries that were surveyed, um, Kenya has gone up uh, quite a bit um, and that rating has been uh, credited on the work that the executive has done uh, through the office of the Attorney General, the registration processes and all that, um, the laws that Parliament uh, has passed or the two houses um, and then, uh, of course, um, there is a bit of uh, indictment again on us in that report. Uh, one, that it takes forever for cases to be determined. And two, um, that the orders we give sometimes, uh, be it an injunction uh, regarding a land where an investor wants to uh, put his money, um, sometimes are given ex parte, uh, delaying mega projects. Um, and so um, there are questions, there are questions uh, that we need to address. Um, and this is what I keep saying, that it is not good to have an efficient executive and efficient legislature and the most inefficient uh, judiciary uh, by the way we distribute resources. The judiciary is, to use this strong word, retarded because of the way it is treated. For us, all of us to march, the three arms, to march together in unison to achieve these goals, there is need for equity. Um, if the executive gets nearly one trillion in its budget, of course, it's, uh, the executive is very big. Parliament gets 37 billion, and then you give judiciary 17 billion. Then you can see why we cannot walk in the same, uh, at the same speed. So, so you're saying that uh, it is lack of finances that is just making, support generally, just so, so that they can just support. For yeah, instance, yeah. not just finance. Yeah. I mean, right now we are not able to, in the court of appeal, and I believe other courts to function uh, to our optimum because. Of And uh, that uh, 
been uh, you have increasing. many many people in this country who have faith in your leadership and uh, your work as a judge I, I received so many when when you came for this interview and it was overwhelming my Facebook my Twitter saying that uh, Uko is the man and uh, when we unveiled the the candidate for Chief Justice. Also my friends from East of the Mountain were very excited and saying thank you for delivering a seat for us. Uh, and um, thereafter, even yesterday, I got a lot of calls, messages saying that it is our turn, our region has to get, you have three today. You have Justice Uko, you have Selgon, and you have Yano. You have to give us one. Talking as now the, the West. <laughs> and when you look at Article 232, it, 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 it says that uh, we need to ensure that regional balance, diversity, communities should be involved in Europe. How do we do this? Because it looks like it is just written but it has become very difficult to, to implement in a way because to, to prescribe a, 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 a way of doing it seems not to come out. But everybody in every function, in every state, people talk about it. How do we do it so that our people in this country get to know that we look at integrity, we look at competence, and then we look at suitability as is. And how do we ensure that we, we, we really uh, sort out this issue of regional balance that is coming out in every, everywhere, even in Parliament when they are electing even chairmen, everywhere. How do we, how do we, what is your view on how to sort it out? Um, diversity, um, ethnicity, our time to eat um, is a very, very dangerous disease. Very, very, very dangerous. Um, and people say in our region, uh, I really don't have a prescription. Uh, all I know is that we are very deeply tribal, deeply, deeply, even in this commission, deeply tribal. I want to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Judge, I don't have very many questions. Uh, I want to start off with one question that is simple that, but may also be quite hard. Uh, what I want to ask you, how do your colleagues in the Court of Appeal describe you? Well, yeah, you correctly say difficult. Um, maybe from rumors, because they, the people describe you, not to your face. Of course, they say nice things uh, for you to hear. Uh, they say many nice things, uh, like uh, Commissioner Mashari has said, you know, humble, you are a team player. Uh, but behind me, they think I push them too hard. I'm a slave driver. Um, and sometimes I go out of my way uh, to seek results, and not just results, uh, immediate result, excellent result. So the, uh, I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but of course, um, sometimes I realize that uh, uh, I'm pushing them, and uh, so sometimes I slow down and consult them. Thank you for that honest and candid answer. The other question I want to ask you is whether you believe in mentorship and whether you take your time to mentor others. Um, I do. Um, 
not all the time. Um, I can say when I was um, in the High Court, um, whenever we had, uh, uh, in all the stations I served, uh, students from the university who came to, um, to be attached to the courts, uh, I would take my time, unlike my colleagues, um, to explain to them the processes of court, the way we dressed, the language we used, um, and that's something I did throughout. I don't see uh, much of it in the Court of Appeal now because um, we, we are hardly even introduced to the students. They come, they go to court, uh, sometimes just in the registry. So there is um, it's very uh, little mentorship opportunity. Uh, I mentor also uh, in local schools. Uh, last time I was here, I mentioned um, in the local school in my village in Osenge. Um, I mentor students in schools. Um, I mentor when I worked in Nakuru and even in the Court of Appeal before I became president. Um, I used to mentor students in uh, St. Andrews, uh, Turi, as well as Green States in Nakuru. Thank you. Uh, another question I want to ask you. Within the judiciary, there has been feedback uh, that I have received as a representative of KMJA that we do not have a structured mechanism for seniors to mentor juniors. Now, looking at you, my lord, you have risen through the ranks from DM professional all the way to the Court of Appeal. You are sort of an icon that members, especially in my cadre, look up to. Now, I want to give you an opportunity to mentor in the air, a <laughs> concept that uh, we just uh, learned of the other day here in the commission. A member of this institution who, has, who is currently maybe in the rank of resident magistrate, in your experience, what words of wisdom would you share with them? We never get opportunities to mentor uh, colleagues in a structured way, apart from occasional uh, bumping onto each other and advising. Uh, but this need, as um, KMJA in the past, the current one I can't describe, um, in the past there were opportunities even to, you know, have gatherings where you get senior judges. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <coughs> who would come to talk to magistrates and encourage them uh, to show them that it's possible. And so uh, on this occasion, uh, since I do not have any other platform, and as you've requested, is to tell that RM that I was a DM, one level below him or her, and through hard work, through integrity, and through being very sensitive to the people you serve, you can rise. You can rise and be anything in this judiciary. Just keep to a straight line, do your work, and you will reach. Thank you very much, Judge. I wish you well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. Your Honor, this is the end of this interview. And on behalf of the Honorable Commissioners, I want to thank you for coming for the second time and engaging with us. And we wish you all the best. I don't know that we have, we have anything to tell us, Your Honor. Really, just to thank uh, you chair and the commissioners for this second uh, opportunity um, i also want just to wish you all the very best as you come towards the end of this very grueling exercise if it has drained me this way i don't know how much you have been drained but i pray to god that you still maintain some strength as you conclude this very very important exercise thank you Thank you very much, uh, Yona.